for a stroll around Bath. Now the map I'd like you to look at is on the wall behind me. It's actually a map of Bath in 1735 and it's orientated rather differently. So it's orientated east-west rather than north-south. So here is the abbey. Here is the line of the medieval walls around the city. We're going to start our walk at Nelson House, which didn't exist in 1735. It's just green fields. But we're going to stroll across the Abbey Churchyard. We're going to stroll down Westgate Street, turning right in what is now Saw Close, where the Theatre Royal is. Now, off Saw Close, there is a little lane, St John's Court. And it's in a house in St John's Court that the subject of our talk used to reside in the 18th century, Richard Nash, better known as Bonash. Bonash arrives in Bath in 1705 on an outing, but he likes what he sees and he decides to stay. And he stays for the next 56 years, so Bath has that effect on people. In 1705, Bath was just taking off as a destination for the social elites to come and enjoy themselves, partly because of, of the visits of Queen Anne. Brandy Anne, as she was known for, for her liking for that particular commodity. Um, I have a friend who has very bad gout and he tells me, Andrew, it has nothing to do with my consumption of alcohol. Well, be that as it may, Queen Anne had pretty bad gout and she found coming to Bath to take the waters relieved her of the symptoms of her gout. So when Queen Anne came, the court came as well and Bath's popularity began to build from those visits. Now, when Nash arrived in 1705, he gets a job uh, as a, an assistant to the Master of Ceremonies, Captain Webster. It was an unpaid job. Uh, and Captain Webster, after a few months, was killed in a duel. Uh, and the City Corporation decided to give Richard Nash uh, the job. This was a rather risky appointment because Nash's employment record up to this point had not been too impressive. Nash was the son of a Swansea bottlemaker, Swansea in South Wales. So he was not posh, but he was a bright lad. He went to grammar school. He then went on to Jesus College, Oxford, which had been founded to anglicise Welshmen. And Nash had a wonderful time at Oxford too good a time in some ways because he was sent down after a year. He was thrown out for a scandalous affair with a young lady. But Nash used his contacts in Oxford to gain a commission in the Guards. He became an army officer and he rather, rather enjoyed the grand uniform. He wasn't quite so keen on the discipline and so he left the army and joined the Inner Temple to train to become a lawyer. But I think it's fair to say he spent rather more time studying the laws of chance rather than the laws of the land and he becomes a professional gambler. One event though, whilst he was at the Inner Temple, uh, does give a hint at Nash's future because in 1695 he organised a mask and entertainment for William III and this is an indication of, of uh, Nash's his future. Um, so, here is Nash as Master of Ceremonies in Bath in 1705. Uh, what does the Master of Ceremonies do? What does it mean? Well, if you're looking for a contemporary equivalent, it's a bit like being the Director of Leisure and Tourism today. So his job is to encourage people to come to Bath, and once they're here, they have a good time, and they all go home and tell their friends, you must go to Bath, it's a marvellous place to go. And Nash does lots of things to improve the city. Better street paving, um, better, more spacious pavements for people to promenade on, better places of entertainment. So in 1706, the first pump room was opened. Two years later, Thomas Harrison, in conjunction with Nash, opens the first assembly rooms, Harrison's rooms, on Terrace Walk. And they included Harrison's Walk, uh, which was an outdoor space, which is now part of what is uh, Parade Gardens. But perhaps the most important thing Nash does is to introduce a code of behaviour into Bath. In the early 18th century, Bath was a bit like the Wild West. It was a gambling town. People would be drinking, gambling late into the night, 
there'd be arguments and disputes and duels and blood all over the streets. Uh, and so Nash wanted none of that. Nash wanted Bath to be a polite, civilised society. And so he introduced a code of behaviour. Gentlemen were not allowed to wear swords within the city. This was revolutionary. No duels were to be fought. Every public event had to finish at 11 o'clock at night and you all had to go home and get tucked up in bed and behave yourselves. There's a nice story of Princess Amelia, who was a daughter of George II. Princess Amelia was a, a bit of a party girl and she was at a ball, at a dance one night, having a wonderful time. 11 o'clock came, the music stopped, everybody packed up to go home and Princess Amelia went up to Nash and said, Mr Nash, I'm having such a wonderful evening, can't the dancing go on a little longer? And so Nash replied, but your grace, you know the rules in Bath, everything must stop at 11. So Princess Amelia stamped her little royal foot and she said, but Mr Nash, I'm a royal princess. To which Nash replied, but I, your grace, am the king of Bath. And I think that story actually illustrates what's going on in Bath because here is a daughter to the king being told what to do by the son of a Swansea bottle maker. And so we have a certain degree of social levelling going on in Bath, which doesn't happen anywhere else. So you have to have money to come to Bath, but if you are a mill owner in Manchester or a steelworks owner in Birmingham, you can come to Bath and you can mix with dukes and duchesses, lords and ladies, which you can't do anywhere else. You certainly can't do where you live and you can't do it in London either. And Nash is to a great de degree responsible for this greater social cohesion in Bath. So uh, here is, is Nash, well known for his wit and repartee, but he is outwitted on one glorious occasion by John Wesley. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. Uh, John Wesley, who felt Bath was the house of Satan. It was a den of iniquity where all sorts of terrible things happened. And Nash and Wesley really disliked each other very strongly. And they met one day on a very crowded pavement and it was clear one of them was going to have to give way. They were walking towards each other. And so Nash strolled imperiously up to Wesley and said, I never give way to fools. At which point Wesley stepped into the road, bowed and said, oh, but I always do. <laughs> which, which put Nash firmly in his place. Uh, Nash wasn't outwitted on many occasions. Um, but here he is then. For 56 years of Master of Ceremonies, he is organising events. Uh, he is taking a share of the profits from the card tables. He is welcoming the important people as they arrive to Bath. Uh, on some occasions, he even puts up an obelisk to commemorate such visits. So Frederick, Prince of Wales, was honoured with an obelisk in Queen Square. And William, Prince of Orange, with an obelisk in Orange Grove. Towards the end of Nash's life, he really uh, falls on financial hard times and becomes physically frail. He loses a lot of money in a court case, and money from the gaming tables uh, is starting to decline, and he gets himself in serious debt. And the city corporation bail him out with a, with a pension. As his health fails, He's looked after by his last mistress, who have the glorious name of Juliana Popjoy, uh, and he dies at the age of 86. Not a bad age in the 18th century, and he's given a grand funeral and buried in Bath Abbey. And you'll see a plaque to Nash on the right-hand side of the nave. But what to make of Beau Nash? Was he particularly Beau? Well, if you look at portraits of him, he's not particularly handsome. If you read his so-called witticisms, they seem rather lame today, and his attempts at writing poetry were truly atrocious. But he had a certain charm, he had a certain style, he had enormous self-belief. Um, he had a certain talent for 
self-promotion. He dressed rather extravagantly. He had a black wig and a white beaver tra uh, trimmed hat. He travelled like a great lord, his coach drawn by six grey horses, with outriders playing horns and a liveried footman running in front to clear the way. So he was what we might describe in the 21st century as a celebrity. Um, he was famous for being famous in a way. Perhaps he was more substance, sorry, he was more style than substance. Uh, but he did, during his time in Bath, transform it from being a small spa town into the resort for the, uh, for the elites in the 18th century and his rules of conduct, his insistence on polite, civilised behaviour uh, spread from Bath throughout the rest of the country and had a significant impact.